I think it's a very strong message that Hamas has put out here, the sense that one political leader was killed, a political leader in Ismail Haniyeh, who was considered to be, and this is, of course, specific to the local context of Hamas, a pragmatic yet moderate figure has been replaced by a hardline, security-conscious, vociferously anti-Israeli figure in Yahya Sinwa. And I think that is a very clear message to Israel that says, if you are to continue with this process of targeting leaders, you will then have to deal with people who are even more committed to this violent cause that the Hamas uh, political and military wings are committed to. But Israel says it's going to continue to pursue Yahya Sinwa, who they blame for the October 7 attack. Now, he has been deep in hiding, I understand, as Hamas leader now, who will presumably take part in ceasefire negotiations. Will he become an easier target? Well, it's a tricky one in the sense that, yes, he is hiding. He is somewhere in Gaza, in tunnels, deep underground which makes negotiations incredibly difficult. He's been obviously central in a lot of this dialogue, a lot of this discourse, but getting messages into him, getting his view, getting the responses from him have often taken days, which has added to the complexity and the challenges of the negotiations. Now that he's obviously the, the leader, the, the, the person responsible for taking these decisions, that's gonna be increasingly difficult not only because of the hardline stance, but because of the practical uh, and technological challenges of getting messages into someone who is in hiding deep underground in a war zone. And with regards to the stance uh, when it comes to negotiations, do you think under a new leader and following the killing of Ismail Haniyeh, um, has Hamas toughened its position on ceasefire and conditions? Will it be harder to reach a deal now, do you think? I think it, it has toughened its stance. It's had a very firm message to Israel here that you kill one, we will find someone who's even tougher, even harder to negotiate with. And I think that is a, a, a deliberate policy here, a deliberate policy of defiance, and that some were expecting a, a vociferous military response, uh, a barrage of rockets or the like. But instead, there's been this symbolic articulation of an even more hard line stance taken against Israel. So there's that. But there's also the fact that um, Yahya Sinwa is, is closer to Iran rather than to Qatar or to Turkey that uh, the previous Hamas leaderships had been close to. And that in some ways reduces the potential influence that Doha or Ankara may have that leverage over the, the negotiations, over the diplomatic initiatives. And we know from the Iranian position, from everything that's been happening with Iran and Israel of late, Iran is not in the position to accommodate Israeli wishes right now. So I think given the shifting landscape, it's going to be incredibly difficult to get a ceasefire, assuming, of course, that, that is what the Israeli leadership wants at present. Mm. Where are negotiations at at the moment and how long do you think until we see some development, further development on, on this deal? Well, things seem to have stalled um, in light of all of the developments that have been happening in Iran, in, in Lebanon and in Gaza with the, the killing of Ismail Haniya. Um, I think this is... <laughs> This has meant that it's incredibly difficult to find any traction with uh, the diplomatic initiatives, which is going to be even harder now that we have a new leader of Hamas, now that the military and political wings of Hamas have combined to articulate a, a vociferously uh, anti-Israeli resistance. Added to that is Israel's continued commitment to killing uh, the, the new leader. Yahya Sinwa. They have routinely said that he is, and I quote, a dead man walking by virtue of his involvement in the terrorist attacks. And so it's incredibly difficult to envisage a situation in which a diplomatic solution can be found when there are these 
these incredibly strong and violent accusations and articulations from all sides. And Professor, Israel <clears throat> has not uh, claimed responsibility for the assassination of Ismail Haniyeh as yet, but says it's killed other senior Hamas leaders. How many top leaders are there left within Hamas? Is it possible to know? And do we know how much they've been weakened since the start of the war? But they've clearly been weakened by virtue of this targeted assassination of key leadership. We know that Israel has a policy of doing that. It's done that in the West Bank, it's done that in southern Lebanon, and it's done that in Gaza. So there is that precedent there. Uh, of course, Israel has not, not acknowledged and um, accepted that it was responsible for the, the killing of uh, Haniyeh in Tehran. But it is in line and in keeping with its policy. Now, what is happening, of course, is that what the, the the strategy does is that it gets rid of a certain type of individual and creates space for new and perhaps more radical, more vociferous figures to step into the breach. And that seems to have been a policy that the Israelis have failed to acknowledge. They failed to to address this. We've seen it happen before, time and time again. And we're seeing it now with Yahya Sinwar taking on a more important role in an organization by virtue of a more pragmatic, more moderate figure, again, in the context of Hamas being removed from power. Mm. And just finally, there are concerns of a wider conflict breaking out. What could that look like and when? Yeah, there's been concerns about this for a while now, and I don't think, I should stress, that I don't think anyone particularly wants this to descend into a wider regional conflict. It's in no one's interests, and the people of the region, of course, would be absolutely devastated and decimated by this conflict. So that's a, a real worry. I don't think that people want it. The problem is, history has shown us that even when states don't want to go to war or actors don't want to go to war, they can sometimes get pulled into a conflict by virtue of circumstance. And that is what I worry about here. Iran does not want a war. Hezbollah does not want an escalated war. It's seen what Israel can do in Beirut in 2006 with the absolute devastation of Dahia, the southern suburbs. So I don't think anyone wants it. The dangerous course is that things are spiraling and missteps can have devastating consequences. Professor Simon Maben, thanks so much for your analysis. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.